Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Ambassador Koonings, for the invitation. I knew from the time we first met that we would absolutely enjoy continuing the legacy of strong partnership and strengthening relations between the EU and Canada, and especially championing the role that women play in achieving greater international security and stability. I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Stéphane Dion. In thinking about my comments today, two things came to mind. First of all, oddly, was my third year honors political science paper, which I wrote 35 years ago, if you must know. Uh, and the other was about the greater role that women must play in achieving common security. My poli-sci paper was about Britain's debate around joining the old European Economic uh, Union. Uh, it was a tough debate in the country, and it's funny that today, of course, the UK faces the same thing. But what that paper taught me was the challenge of maintaining identity while achieving interdependence and about how getting this right is the foundation for common security. I thought that the opening comments by Mr. Serrano were pointed in describing the growing need for enhanced strategic integration among us. That means between the EU and Canada, and it means between the complementary talent of women and men in the pursuit of common security. The Canada-EU relationship is of fundamental importance to Canada. The EU is Canada's second largest trading, trade and investment partner and central to global issues of concern to Canada. Our greatest security in the face of global risk is, of course, that we have a great friendship, that we know we can count on one another. Indeed, Canada was one of the first countries to enter into an international agreement with what would become the EU. And this year, we happily celebrate the 40th anniversary of the landmark Canada-Europe Framework for Economic and Commercial Cooperation and the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the EU's diplomatic mission in Ottawa. What better way to celebrate than the February 29th announcement this year when Canada and the EU announced the final text of our legally reviewed trade agreement, marking an important step in bringing the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, known as CETA, into being. CETA creates vast new opportunities across the EU and Canada, opening new markets for our exporters and forging closer ties between our economies. And I'm sure, as you know, Canada's Minister of International Trade, Christia Freeland, is a powerful advocate for this agreement. At this time of deep political shifts and continuing uncertainty in the global economy, CETA and the Canada-EU Strategic Partnership Agreement offer the promise of strengthened economies and strengthened ties between societies. We agree on the importance of inclusive and accountable governance, peaceful pluralism, respect for diversity and human rights, including the rights of women and refugees. The cooperation mechanisms we have put in place through CETA will deepen and broaden the scope of our foreign policy and security cooperation on a wide range of issues. CETA sets the gold standard for trade agreements in the 21st century. Today's symposium also raises the most pressing threats to international peace and security, including Russia, Ukraine, Daesh, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and Iran. It's important that Canada and the EU continue to discuss these issues bilaterally and multilaterally. Canada's current contribution of civilian police to EU missions in the Palestinian territories and the Ukraine and the scope for further cooperation are very important to us. We also work together on similar issues in Kosovo. I was just there at the April 8th swearing in of President Thatchy in the very square where he had led the protest against Slobodan Milosevic. The uh, ceremony actually began with tear gas. It was the full Kosovo experience. Um, but also what I could not stop thinking about in that square was how women were used as instruments of war in that war. And we can't forget that. We owe a lot to that horrific uh, legacy. Multilaterally, our new government is committed to re-engaging in peace support operations at the UN, where Prime Minister Trudeau has announced Canada's intention to seek a Security Council seat, as you know. In April, Canada was awarded a seat on the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, which is very exciting and an indication of the greater role 
we plan to play. This brings me to the second thought uh, I had, which is of course about women, peace and security. And this was before I knew that this would be on the agenda. So thank you so much for, uh, for putting it on the agenda and for inviting me. Canada and the EU have demonstrated support for human rights and well-being of women and girls, of course, and especially in situations of conflict and state fragility. So I just would like to read uh, the September 2015 report of the UN Security Council of the Secretary General on Women, Peace and Security. Because here is the situation, quote, Recent reviews of the high-level independent panel on peace operations and by the advisory group of experts on the 2015 review of the UN peacebuilding architecture paint a stark picture of the current peace and security context characterized by blatant violations of human rights and humanitarian law, complex drivers of conflict, involvement of a growing number of non-state armed actors, new technologies, and transnational connections that are changing the nature of warfare. These challenges underline the need for a stronger focus on prevention, more holistic and consistent approaches that place human rights at the core of security protection, political, humanitarian, peace building, and socioeconomic development work." End quote. Knowing that all the evidence shows that inclusion of women leads to more sustainable peace and enhanced prevention efforts, our collective record of unpredictable and insufficient funding, the lack of systematic gender analysis, attitudinal obstacles, and insufficient mapping of needs in planning and budgeting all need dramatic improvement. The evidence is clear. When proper funding, committed and visible leadership, inclusive rights-based and gender equality processes and plans are in place, tangible results for security and stability are achieved. Why in the world, especially today, are we not maximizing the potential of women in the achievement of our common security? A survey of 40 peace processes shows that the ability of women to influence negotiations increases the chances of agreements being reached and succeeding. There was not a single case where organized women's groups had a negative impact on a peace process. In particular, one of the most repeated effects was that the ability of women to push for the commencement, resumption, or finalization of agreements when momentum had stalled or talks had failed. However, the participation of women in formal peace processes still remains contested. Inclusion is mostly initiated and attained through concerted pressure by women's organizations rather than by the parties to the conflict, the mediators, or the organizers of the negotiations. Our Prime Minister has created a cabinet which is equally men and women, and also his appointments to parliamentary secretaries are, are equally men and women. But the intent is not to demonstrate equality or inclusion for the sake of it. It is to improve outcomes. It is to drive positive change. The Secretary General's report found that very few of the examined peace agreements reflect comprehensive gender equality or women, peace, and security provisions. There are good examples in Guatemala in the 90s and more recently in Colombia in 2014. But even where agreements have clear language, implementation, as has been noted, uh, is lacking. Uh, Canada's Foreign Affairs Committee has also put women, peace, and security as its first item on the agenda. And so we're in the process now of hosting witnesses. Two weeks ago, the presentation by General Jonathan Vance, chief of the defense staff, was truly inspiring. He spoke of what he saw in Afghanistan and the war's effort on women and girls. And he said, it was also in Afghanistan that I saw how having women within our ranks could dramatically improve the operational effectiveness of the Canadian Armed Forces. Having women in our ranks opened doors for us. He stated that ensuring that the Canadian Armed Forces fully implement the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security is a priority. I'm very proud of General Vance and his commitment to fully integrate these requirements into Canadian Armed Forces planning, operations, and beyond. In closing, I would like to thank all of our European Union partners for today. We truly are strategic partners, and as Rear Admiral Scott Bishop said, we have to employ all instruments of national power. At the first meeting of the Foreign Affairs Committee earlier this year, we heard from Canada's Women, Peace, and Security Network. 
One of the uh, male members of parliament asked the presenter what would it take to get women more involved in peace and security negotiations. She said, invite us. Today has been one grand invitation to pull together. Canada is entirely committed to the EU and to our common security and to each and every one of you. Thank you very much.